All right, certainly good to see all of you today. Psalm 22, Psalm 22. I'll be as um, expeditious as I can be. Expeditious as I can be. I hope all of you can hear me well. Sometimes it, I don't get the same feedback that you do. But we've considered the excruciating anguish of Christ on the cross. He cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. Well, we know the word God is strong one. He said it twice. My strong one, my strong one. Now, you remember, he's the debased one. He's crying out, my strong one. We've learned that forsaken, he says, oh, my God, in verse 2. He says, oh, you, my help, in verse 19. So he knows that he's calling out something very unique in this statement. My strong one, my strong one. Why are you so far from helping me? It's for us to ask. It's exonerating his father, exonerating the predeterminate counsel and foreknowledge of God in the intended purpose and design for sending Christ into the world in the first place. There's nothing here disrupted in the Godhead. There's nothing here disrupted in the relationship between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit bearing testimony of Christ through this inspired writing that's a thousand years prior to the event itself. My strong one, my strong one, according to what reason, let's say, the question, the interrogative here, according to what reason am I bid to remain on this tree? What reason? That's a good question. What is this rationale of this holy righteous God to have the demands of His justice met by the only person who could meet it, His elect one, Isaiah 42, His sinless Son, Jesus. The one He said was His beloved Son. He even said His elect one in one text in reference to His baptism. He said, this is my beloved Son. Listen to Him. And we've certainly learned that unless someone's persuaded by the Scriptures, listening won't occur. Listening will not occur. The man Christ Jesus called on God in direct address with intensity and passion. Well, that's obvious. It's so obvious what he's doing. But isn't it strange that it's so obvious that we try to somehow embellish the account as if somehow we can get into the gory of the story. And that's not the story. <laughs> it's not the gory. They know each other. Jesus is son of David. His father David prophesied concerning the Sunday. Matter of fact, David was raised in Judah. And Jesus is the lion of Judah. So when we read roaring, why do we not hear the roaring of the lion of Judah? How strong is this man that it could be any more clearly presented that he's roaring as the Lion of Judah. He's not whimpering. He's not something that is a victim in any sense of the word that we would think of that. The implication that he's here by design and intention and of his own will relinquished to his father's will being accomplished is what should cause us all to hear the Lion of Judah roaring. And all of us knowing as we learned in the Bible that it was revealed to us the wisdom in the cross and what He was accomplishing and not to those people, those rulers of the day. Because He said if they had known the wisdom of God in the cross, but they didn't, then they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, but they did. Why would they have had anything to do with accomplishing God's will in the crucifixion of Jesus were they aware of any degree that it was the accomplishment of God's will and purpose to reconcile the world unto Himself by his son's death, being a curse, hanged on the tree, receiving the consequence of all the law, being the one who fulfilled the law, fulfilled all righteousness, being the one who's now revealed to us his righteousness, his state of justice that has shown him alone as the one who could and would fulfill it. Jesus is quoting the first part of this psalm from the cross. Now by that... By that, he meant for his hearers, as the teacher he is, still teaching, still careful, still with his wits about himself, as though it were possible that could have happened, that he would be somehow disoriented on the cross. He was never disoriented. He was never out of control. You know, I read a, an event where someone had attempted to kill themselves in some stunt, 
somehow they were jumping off a waterfall or something. And in the interview, they said, when did you decided, when did you decide that you no longer wanted to kill yourself? He said, as soon as I went over the fall. Now he goes around telling people this motivational story, so to speak. But you notice that if one of us were to, let's say, take a leap off of a high building, we'd be out of control from the moment we jumped. We'd realize real quick and soon before we hit bottom that somehow this is out of our control. There's nothing here happening that's out of his control. He's teaching. The master teacher is teaching from the cross while nailed to that cross. Eventually, five wounds he would receive while there. And he's teaching. You ever had a rough day trying to teach a class? Sometimes I hear pastors say they have a hard time finding someone to teach. Now, we have someone they couldn't stop from teaching. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Thank God. Thank God. He says, when he quoted that portion of the psalm, it was so they would remember and be reminded and have come to mind to them all of the psalm. The strong one God, his father, notice this, and the debased one. You remember, he is now servile. He debased himself when he took on the status of a bond slave and remained debased until a kind of death, even the death of the cross, and was cursed being hanged on the tree, received the consequence. Now someone tells me when I once had numbers thinking the earth had had over 100 billion living on it, someone has uh, given me some feedback that it may have been 40 billion. So I was trying to adjust my math. 40 billion people times three infractions a day times 613 culpability. You can do the arithmetic. But how sufficient is this one to bear this weight and have this brought upon him in such a manner that the father would be satisfied with what occurred to him? Jesus is groaning as I said, that term can be used for the roaring of a lion. And you would be better understanding the narrative and understanding the roaring of a lion, noticing the strength of this one under a circumstance where he's so cognizant and so capable and so willing that he's still teaching while being nailed to this tree. He knows exactly why he was given, the Bible says in Isaiah 42. He was given to be a covenant to the people and a light for the Gentiles. Notice that. He is the covenant. He was given to be the covenant, the mediator and the testator of the covenant. That's why we don't have a higher honor. We don't have a, 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 an, another apex in our life as His ecclesia. Then when we present ourselves at His table in remembrance of Him, and we take of that bread and drink from that cup, knowing that it was He who said, This cup is the new covenant in my own blood. And we have nothing greater than that high honor and favor, that grace from God to participate in His new covenant that's in the blood of His Son, which the Bible says He is our covenant. He understood with perfect understanding why the covenant-keeping God, Jehovah, had bid His beloved Son to remain there on that tree. You remember, if you're faithful unto death, that is, if you're obedient unto death, then the last moment, if you're still alive, you're still receiving instruction. And while still alive, receiving instruction from his father to remain on that tree, he is teaching. Revelation 5, 5 says, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. You remember in eschatological uh, conjecture, people are alarmed at maybe this book and seals being broken. And yet according to the book that apparently they don't take a lot of notice to, uh, weeping and lamentation were the sentiment toward even the possibility that there would be no one worthy to open that book. But comfort is given in the Scriptures. Don't weep. Jesus isn't whimpering. If Jesus were anything close to that debilitated condition that any one of us would have incurred, it would have been a different situation entirely. I was laughing in between my own two ears as I was approaching today because I was feeling a lot better physically. Last week, ears ringing, touch of vertigo, voice about to go out. I have no idea what I said. 
I'd have to watch the tape, so to speak. But what would it be like to be nailed to a tree as the master teacher and still prevail that opposition to teach? What is it, as I have to say to people and have to be very careful, I, I haven't found anything. I haven't found a formidable foe nor a problem of a degree of difficulty that would even warrant my skill set when I was 25 years old. Religion is one of the goofiest things I've ever seen. The bullies we had were illiterate, no intelligence quotient to speak of, and no character. Oh, wow. No wonder they were so intimidating. No wonder circumstances seemed to be impossible. How will we ever win against this? Because there was nothing there. Now, this man, Christ Jesus, didn't enjoy the luxury of social constructs and social drama. He's not simulating being nailed to a tree. He's not saying, oh no, this didn't turn out well. You remember those that thought they were, as I like to call them, the snake worshipers, were thought they were really doing something to Jesus. And they would rid themselves of this Jesus. Psalm 2 said, let us break their cords. Let's break their bands. They won't rule over us, this Godhead, this one who will... Uh, inaugurate his son in Zion. This, this won't happen. And the, they were raging, the Bible says. And these snake worshipers were wiggling around saying, oh, we've got him now. We've got him now. And when they placed him on that tree, he crushed the head of their leader. <laughs> you know, the big snake, the big serpent. I know that's charming and funny to some of you, especially with the insight we have in Christ Jesus, especially in his ecclesia. To notice that all of that turmoil and all that conspiracy, as Isaiah 53 says, we they were in this fervor to conspire him as smitten of God, receiving what he deserved. Oh, don't you love getting worked up in that battle of finally getting someone? He can't be gotten. When they took up stones to stone him, he made his way through them without them even having the ability to apprehend just exactly what happened. Where did he go? And until his time was fulfilled, he would not lay down his life. And when he laid down his life, he took it up again. As I said, if I were to make some foolish attempt to take a flying leap, I wouldn't be able to take it back up again. And I wouldn't be able to uh, modify my plan as I was incurring the consequence of my calamitous conduct. Jesus was not in a haphazard way and things didn't end well or end badly as appraised by the religious world who is so addicted to negating Christ Jesus. Do you know that something I studied years ago when I was just a youngster, I was studying the pattern of all these different religions and so many of them had some feature in their expression of faith that nullified everything that Jesus was asserted to be according to the Bible. If it were the Trinity, no, he's not the central person of the Godhead, they would say. If it was the fact that the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily, they said, no, he was just a man that sort of, kind of wish he had a been and we could all become the same thing. But wasn't it striking that all of these particular religions in the world had found necessary for their success the nullity of Christ? I mean, we have to do something with Jesus if we're going to get on with what we're here to do. But the more the snake worshipers wiggled, the worse it was for the king snake. <laughs> it crushed his head. I love that. I love that. Luke one thirty two says, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. How will he ever make it to the throne of David if we crucified him? How will he ever be inaugurated in Zion? How will he ever be enthroned if he's nailed to a tree? <laughs> oh, these poor souls. But for the grace of God, we would be just like it. We would go along with people to diminish Christ, make him a nullity, stop the man Christ Jesus from being the head of his ecclesia, for example, stop his teachings from being relevant, stop families from examining their lives in light of the words of Christ that we were given so graciously so that we could build our house upon that rock. 
Matthew 27, 46 is about the ninth hour. Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is to bid me. Why did you bid me to remain on this tree? That's for us to ask. Habakkuk cried out, How long, O Lord, do I cry violence? He was exonerating God because what happened? God brought in that fierce army of, the, of Nebuchadnezzar and He brought those Chaldeans in to judge the wicked brethren of the southern tribe of Judah. He wasn't crying vandalism. It wasn't because they were spray painting on the side of camels. No, they were violent, cruel people to just covenant community members. My, don't we love to see people get a covenant community member. My covenant people are so strangely perceived today, but for the fact that coincidentally we seem to incite the worst out of those who can't seem to conceal themselves and help themselves when we are ambassadors for the sake of Christ Jesus. Hebrews 5, 8, Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. He learned obedience? The man Christ Jesus, the son of David, learned obedience, that's experientially learned to remain under the voice of his father at the moment, until the moment he died, he was under the voice of his father. He said, John 12, 27, Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I into this world. The Bible says there's one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Him being delivered, Acts 2, 23, by the discernment counsel and foreknowledge of God. It says, Ye have taken Him and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. But we know there was the purpose in that. Isn't it the irony of it all? that He came to be flesh and dwelt among us. And the Bible says He condemned sin in the flesh. And if your appraisal of sin doesn't match the Bible and you don't have the proper appraisal of severity of sin, that is why we have death, then the remedy might not properly be appraised until we see what He remedied. The Bible says that in Philippians 2, 8, being found in fashion as a man, He humbled Himself became obedient unto death, even death, the last command he received. Remain on the tree. Remain on the tree. Have you ever been in a pickle by the social arrangements of others who designed to make it and exasperate you, frustrate you? Maybe this will trip. That's not what this is talking about. You know, the people that were involved in all this, he created he created them. You remember the dark-minded, hard-hearted, and void of spirit of Christ governor who said, do you not realize that I have the authority to sentence you to death? And Jesus had to correct that and say, you would have no authority over me were it not given to you from above. Now you have to be born again to believe that. There's no way unless you're born from above, unless you trusted Jesus Christ, unless you've been fathered through the gospel, unless you have been raised spiritually, quickened spiritually, immediately, eternally by Christ Jesus through His death, through His burial, if you've never trusted Him, but unless you've trusted Him, that doesn't make sense. That He was in charge of the people who were in charge of Him. 2 Corinthians of our interest says in 5.23, For He made Him to be sin. That's a sin offering for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Now that might not doubt or possibility. It's purpose. That didn't fail and nothing can prevail that purpose, by the way. If you and I were to miss the narrative of the cross, the message of the cross, that it was inevitable that Jesus would prevail and that what God designed in His determinate counsel and according to His foreknowledge to accomplish by His Son, Christ Jesus, then you've missed everything. Some have even taught maybe Jesus was a plan B. <laughs> really? It, wouldn't that be like the second string being better than the first string? Wouldn't that be like God saying, hmm, maybe I didn't get it right the first time? I was hearing people talk about possible worlds and how they went through all of these calculations and perhaps God took His Rolodex out and flipped through it to see which world would be the best world. The only problem with that is God's first thought is the best thought. There is no God in the Bible who has to take a second look. 
He says, made him to be a sin offering. The strong one, notice, is far removed from helping him. The debased one, the elect one, the chosen one, for this very purpose, the debased one, obeying his last command, teaching to the last moment, he remains on the tree and will do so until this horrible statement in the Bible. All we like sheep have gone astray, Isaiah 53, 6. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. We are iniquitous people. Iniquity. If you look that up, you'll find that word that some use, depravity. It's actually a worse word than that. Our perversities. That was laid on Jesus. Our perversities. Every perverse thought, every perverse word, every perverse act, every perverse deed in commission and omission. As someone is giving me feedback that could be up to 40 billion people. I mean, I don't even like being guilty by association with some of the filth that I have been guilty by association. Oh, at their discretion. At their discretion. Just arbitrary. Did you notice that? I, I was even in a situation where we were making a particular product and someone said, how can you, a preacher, be involved in the manufacture of this? I said, well, it's very accurate, the ones I make. Amen. Now, how, how can you be there at that particular place? I know some of those people that go there. I'm like, well, uh, but for the grace of God, I could be like that. I mean, I wish everyone, wouldn't that have been great had everyone followed me like I followed Christ? And what pastor couldn't say that except a minion from hell? Except one of the hirelings. Because Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Would you be more studious? Would you be more, have more aptitude in navigating the fallible constructs with which so many are fixated? I mean, fallible constructs are to religion what the Rubik's Cube is to mathematics. It's just a toy that millions, perhaps billions, have been sold. But you don't think people are learning algebra, do you? You don't think they're learning the Cartesian coordinate plane, do you? No. <laughs> no. Not at all. So when someone can't tell you to follow Jesus or follow them the way they follow Christ, it's because they're not following Christ. Matthew 26, 51, Behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Drama, drama, drama. My goodness, I think we continued one of the games in the state championship playoffs and someone lost a finger was broken and the coach said, we don't come out of a game for a finger. What's this ear doing in the story? We have Jesus in Psalm 22 nailed to a tree teaching and yet we have to stop and see that an ear has been lopped off. Then said Jesus unto him, put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Yeah, you keep that sword out, these people with the bigger one will take you down. You know, the sword of states ordained by God. So Jesus was just speaking what we all know self-evident. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father? Just bid a request to my Father. And He shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels, approximately 7,000 per legion. But how then shall the Scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? Wait a minute, you're saying that it must be in this manner... And you're obligated, because of his character, Jesus obligated, behooved him. He's obligated to assure that this takes place and had to inform one of his closest ones, Peter, that are you seriously implicating and indicating that you aren't aware of the fact that I could summon 12 legions of angels so that at every moment when they took his hand and stretched it out, he had to let them do that. At every moment. Do you all know I have a grandson that beat me in chess? Anybody know how he did it? He's not four years old. Anybody know how he did it? With my permission. You know how he beat me? He built a taller tower from the parts on the chess set. 
because I was telling him how they represent parts of a castle. So he built a tower and said, Papa, look, my tower, how tall it is. I said, you got me. He said, what are you saying, Brother Carter? I'm saying that Jesus the Christ on that tree being taken into custody, being smote in the face while they covered his face where he couldn't even flinch. You notice that. He let them place that on his head. When they pulled his body apart where he could count his bones, he let them do that. Now, hear the Lion of Judah roar. Hear that. I saw a beagle pup not even bigger than this last week. I mean, he's nothing. And here's my American bulldog that's bigger every day. Taken in off the streets. Big logging chain for a collar. And he's sitting there basking in the sun and the beagle pup runs and just slams into his side. And Bogart just sits there. I'm thinking, I wonder what's wrong with that beagle pup that he doesn't know <laughs> that if Bogart wanted to, he could just mix him with the dog food. What is it that would make people approach this account as we would like to do in the flesh and think, oh no, oh no. There's no oh no with the Lion of Judah roaring. There's no whimpering from a cross that was designed and intended for him to demonstrate his obedience unto death in the last command to remain there. Now I tell you what, every one of us know in our flesh when we don't like when someone gets over us. And Jesus designed it to receive the advantage. The Bible says He's a propitiation for our sins, not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. There was a prophecy in the Bible in the book of Ruth. Blessed be the Lord, that is Jehovah, which has not left thee, that is neither us, this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous, pronounced, published, broadcast in Israel. The word Israel means God prevails at the biggest loss in history, at the biggest and most severe elimination and nullification of a ministry, God prevails. For it became Him, the Bible says, Hebrews 2, verse 10, for it became Him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons unto glory. And He has brought many sons unto glory. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now notice this, the word captain, it's the lead chief. The lead chief. I was recently, again, reading an article by spiritual, about spiritual bullying by Dr. Roger Copeland. And he was talking about a situation there were too many chiefs. You remember, people uh, saw how effective it was to become a chief. Not for the good of the tribe, though. Not for the good of the ecclesia. Only thing is, sometimes people that are that ignorant, that dark-minded, that hardened in the heart, and that voice of the Spirit of Christ, forget that there is a lead chief. There is a chief shepherd. There is someone that will take the very things against him and then reveal it that he was designing it for his own glory to bring even more, that is, many sons to glory. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be this sin offering. Purpose we might be the righteous God qualified in Him. I iterate that for the reason of stating, how would we ever become the righteousness of God, which is the ultimate expression of that feature apart from which one cannot stand before God right in any way? Apart from the faithfulness of Christ, that one who lived the life we couldn't live, the one who lived the life we didn't want to live, the one who fulfilled the law we didn't fulfill, couldn't fulfill, and didn't want to fulfill... Because what would have happened to us? Have you ever tried to do right and watch it not always bring what you would expect otherwise? I've often said, I can't wait till the stakeholder returns bodily. Oh, what a day of rejoicing that will be. For whom? Those of us who what? Agonized the good agony. Now those who've anti-agony, agonized. Get that? An antagonist anti-agonizes. You're trying to go forward with the gospel and that is against which they anti-agonize. You have to help people understand that antagonists are just waiting on your next agony. Just waiting. Every time Jesus made a move, you remember they carefully attend alongside of Him in the synagogue in order that they might accuse Him since He would heal on the Sabbath day. You could forecast 
move in his actions and say it with accuracy that if there's someone stooped over in this synagogue, the synagogue ruler knew, oh no, there's Jesus. We know he'll heal this woman on the Sabbath. And there they were, carefully with their legal pads, so hard-hearted. The man with the withered hand caused him to be enraged and looked on them for the hardness of their heart. Thank God, being nailed to a tree was the last thing he was willing to do and remain there. Galatians, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain, and righteousness does not come by the law. Righteousness comes by the one who fulfilled the law, Jesus Christ. For if there had been a law according to which righteousness and a standing before God could have been achieved, then Christ died in vain. God forbid, the Bible says. Notice in the crucifixion of the man Christ Jesus, the Father has been and remains conciliated, perfectly satisfied. It is finished. That's in relationship to the Father. Believers, past, present, and future are redeemed by their kinsmen. It is finished. You say, wait a minute. How does God know the future as well as the past, as well as the present, Brother Carter? Jesus Himself prayed, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on Me through their word. John 17, 20. you remember the first time you read that? How your heart burned knowing that He prayed then for you now? You remember that? I couldn't get over it. You ever had someone pray for you and you thanked them for it? You acknowledged, I mentioned last week, a young man named Nathan, and he was encouraging his fellowship to pray for me under a certain circumstance. And I was talking about how encouraging it was. What does it do for us when we know that then He prayed for us now? It makes what we're doing inevitable. Well, the first time I told someone I don't believe in goal setting, they said, why not? I said, I would prefer to engage and invest my life in the inevitabilities. That which is so sure that it doesn't have a risk of failure. That's following Jesus. It says, for Christ also has suffered for sins once suffered the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the spirit that's 1 Peter 3.18 and I'll close in this the one who remains in unbelief that is the one who continually is negating persuasion I'll call them the dissuader I actually receive a newsletter called the persuader well let me talk about the dissuader for a moment the dissuader in John 3.36 it says, The one who is negating persuasion, the one who is without persuasion, and notice this, that word refers to persuadableness. So the one without persuadableness. How do you get to the point where you're without persuadableness? Since in Galatians 5.8, even those in the churches were misled by a persuasion that wasn't from God. Paul told them and corrected them, just as the apostles' letters correct us today. How were they persuadable by Christ and also persuadable by a persuasion that wasn't from God? And yet we read of people who are not able to be persuaded. It's called judicial hardening. You remember, even as a young pastor, some people try to take me to the Hard nuts to crack. Why will we aggrandize someone for something that is not admired in the Bible? Nothing that brings glory to God and good to the neighbor. The unbeliever who persists in his unbelief, his negation of persuasion by the grace of God, the content of the gospel, will one day be cast into hell. Did you hear that? That word hell refers to Hades says, when death and hell are cast in the lake of fire, he will incur death for all eternity. Dead now in sins and trespasses. Dead unto God, being outside of Christ Jesus, which is exactly what that means. Now dead to persuasion in this lifetime. Then placed into Hades, that side where we read that the rich man lift up his eyes being in torment and wanting to, hey, grab me some water, please. Hey, I know what will work. Send back someone from the dead that they might warn my brethren. And the Bible says that Abraham said that since they are not listening to Moses and the prophets, then they will not be 
persuaded should one rise from the dead. And notice, even in Hades, he wasn't persuaded. Book of Revelation says, people will gnaw and gnash, chewing their own tongues in pain and agony, still refusing to repent. Ugly picture when you're beyond persuasion, that judicial hardening declaration by God. Revelation 20, 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Sins, dead then in hell, and dead forever in the lake of fire, the second death. Luke 16, 23. I just quoted it. Notice works of law in this lifetime will not conciliate the Father. And notice the people that feign that they're doing it, the Bible has revealed to us that they're not concerned with the law. They're just saying they're doing it. It will not conciliate the Father. Duration of hell will not conciliate the Father. Remain in Hades, remain in hell until death and hell are cast in the lake of fire and it will not have accrued, earned, merited, or atoned for anything. The Father will not accept that. It has nothing to do with what Jesus alone accomplished in His faithfulness unto death, His obedience unto death. And then, an eternity in the lake of fire will not conciliate the Father. The divine discretion of the Godhead and His character, God is light in Him, there's no darkness at all. There are no negative externalities. There's nothing that people need to fix about the Bible. I've been so amazed at how many people want, could you fix this? It's not broken. Oh, well, listen, can you try to explain what someone tried in trying to fix really gummed it up? Really? <laughs> One of the first things you learn as a process control specialist is eliminate the variables and don't contribute to variation by tampering with it. You only need two people, and let's say it's a large company with a lot of machines and a lot of process. You need two people, one to watch the machines and one to watch the person so he doesn't touch the machines, right? What would it be about the gospel of Jesus Christ that would warrant our fixing that minding in association with God would not do just fine? It says Jeremiah 10, 12, He hath made the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Discretion refers to understanding intelligence. Psalm 147 5 says, Great is our God and of great power, his understanding is infinite. Perhaps we might foresee something he didn't calculate. Would say the person that hasn't read much. Acts 17 30, referring to all men everywhere are now commanded to be minding. Notice this. It's the word repent, but it means minding continuously in association with God the Father. Hear that? It's the same word in the Great Commission. I will be with you, be in association with you all until the end of the age in that disciple-making process, assuring us that we're collaborating and co-working and co-laborers with Christ Jesus. The term meta, as I just said, denotes association, union, accompaniment. Refers to association and companionship, participation. Acts 20, 21, testifying both the Jews and also the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. This word and refers to that is. He's continuing to speak. Which means that faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, that is the latter statement, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ relates to the same person, God the Father, that is expressed or described by the first expression, namely... His, the obligation and the high honor to mind in association with God the Father, that is to trust into Jesus Christ. So if you haven't trusted into Jesus Christ, you remember He came and said, repent, mind in association with me. The dissuader cannot say that he is minded in association with God the Father while negating faith toward the Lord of us, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, we bow before You now. So grateful for the clarity of Scripture. So thankful for your gracious revelation of your heart of love, your kindness, your desire to send this light into all the world, this light that your son Jesus affirmed himself to be. He's the true light. Thank you for the honor and trusted this church that we might be the pillar and the ground of the truth. Your son told us that he's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. He told us that... It, no man comes unto the Father except by Him. Thank You for calling us into this work. Thank You for commanding us to mind in association with You. That is, trust in Your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, thank You for the love of Your Son to command us to mind in association with Him, to 
take His teachings as words of life and build our lives upon it so we would have a life established on a rock, a firm foundation. Let the rains fall, let the waters rise, and let the wind blow, for we know the rock on which we stand. For all these good things, this good message of your Son, Jesus Christ, the Lion of Judah, who while nailed to a tree, He roared. While obedient unto death, He taught. He communicated. He persuaded. For this persuasion, we thank You that it's from You and no one else. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.